It's which is a continuation of the UN Observance Day that was celebrated this Monday, October 31st, under the theme of Act Local to Go Global. The WISIS and SDG Talks is a platform dedicated to sharing experiences and inspirational stories about ICTs for development. The themes are aligned with the UN days to highlight the linkages with the WISIS action lines and SDGs and their implementations by all stakeholders all over the world. For the smooth running of the session, we would like to give you some guidelines. Please note that during the session, attendees' microphones are muted. If you would like to intervene, please raise your hand. We will take questions through the Q&A section or in the chat. The meeting is recorded and will be made available on the WISIS and SDG Talks page of the WISIS Forum 2023 website soon after the end of the session. This session is also being live streamed on the WISIS Process Facebook page. Without further delay, let me hand over to Dr. Bilal Jamusi, Chief of Study Groups, Telecommunication and Standardization Bureau of the ITU, to provide his opening remarks. Dr. Jamusi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tala. Greetings to everyone. Mr. Eric Garcetti, esteemed mayor of Los Angeles. Mr. Sami Kanaan, deputy mayor of Geneva, Switzerland. Mr. Thomas Corbinas, deputy mayor of Vilnius, Lithuania. Distinguished speakers, colleagues and friends and dear participants. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you today to the WISIS and SDG TalkX to celebrate World Cities Day. I am delighted to note that this session is being jointly organized with the Geneva Cities Hub in cooperation with UN Habitat. As the majority of the world's population lives in cities, these urban conglomerations are considered the epicenters of human activity and innovation. With nearly 68% of the global population projected to live in cities by 2050, it is pertinent to plan for further growth and provide the basic services, infrastructure, and affordable housing for the expanding populations. Cities currently face a plethora of challenges relating to carbon intensive infrastructures, water shortage, security, urban sprawl, pollution, and traffic congestion, just to name a few. With quality of life at the center of urban planning, digital technologies hold the potential to facilitate progress to a sustainable environment while ensuring resilience of urban settlements and reducing the impact of climate change. We're all aware that um, cities cover only uh, 3% of the Earth's surface they generate more than 70% of the greenhouse gas emission. However, cities also hold the potential to weed out the root cause of climate change and lay the foundation for resilience to counterbalance the negative impacts of climate conditions. In this context, driving digital transformation in the urban domain can foster the adoption of smart solutions for green energy, mobility, and water systems for moving towards net zero emissions. Innovative technologies such as artificial intelligence and internet of things can be the cornerstone for reducing the climate vulnerabilities of cities as these technologies can enhance the potential of analysis, of analyzing the risks and predict the potential damage associated with hurricanes, torrential rain, and heat waves. Another challenge that many cities grapple with is that of water shortage, with 71% of the Earth's surface being covered with water. One might wonder why this predicament would arise anywhere in the world. The answer is simple, access to potable or and contaminated water in cities continues to be a problem as demand often exceeds its supply. While cities can be the hotbeds of water shortage, they can also be a solution for this problem. 
To meet the growing water demand, cities can seek to adopt the circular approach by enhancing wastewater management with the help of technology while reducing reliance on freshwater sources. For example, IoT sensors can play a vital role in detecting chemical residue, PHP levels, and pollutants too. Digital twin simulations can also help enhance operational efficiency of water treatment plants and reduce costs while reducing chances of malfunction. International platforms such as the United for Smart Sustainable Cities supported by 14 UN agencies and coordinated by ITU, UNECE, and UN Habitat, can also play a pivotal role in, the, in facilitating discussions on this topic and help them transition towards achieving climate neutrality and improve the overall resilience of the urban ecosystem. U4SSC serves as an open platform for such dis discussions thereby ensuring that all stakeholders have a voice in the deliberation, which will help us shape our cities of the future. ITU, in its role as an international standards developing organization, has also been curating standards for further, to further guide urban stakeholders along this trajectory of carbon neutrality and resilience. We have a dedicated ITUT study group 20 on the Internet of Things and Smart Cities and Communities, which develops standards to de deliver guidance on the adoption of IoT for smart cities and communities to drive digital transformation in both urban and rural areas. Currently, this study group is developing a set of key performance indicators for assessing ICT-based urban flood disaster prevention, and mitigation capabilities. Furthermore, ITUT study group five on EMF, environment, climate action, sustainable digitization, and circular economy developed standards which provide guidance on leveraging ICT for accelerating a sustainable digital transformation and climate change adaptation and mitigation actions in cities and rural communities in line with various international instruments, such as the SDGs, the Paris Agreement, among others. The study group is currently developing a framework for climate change adaptation in coastal cities using ICT and digital technologies and other standards and low-cost sustainable ICT solutions for climate change adaptation in rural areas and communities. Today's session comes as an opportune time when we are at the cusp of entering into COP27, discussions which will take place next week. COP27 will deliberate on key issues including nature, food, water, industry, decarbonization, and climate adaptation, all of which are essential to be addressed for cities to manage climate emergencies, and transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy and deliver on the targets of the Paris Agreement. We have a multi-stakeholder panel of speakers with us today in line with the WISIS spirit. In this context, the session will be the ideal stepping stone for us to understand how to make our cities more resilient and carbon neutral and water savvy. Like you all, I'd like, I look forward to learning more on this and making con connections and concerted efforts towards a common cause of reducing climate impact on our cities. Thank you all for your attention and all the speakers for joining us today and wish you an enriching session ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jamusi, for providing this framework for our session for today. And um, it is my pleasure now to invite and hand over the session to our moderator and co-organizer of the session, Ambassador Ambras Soreni, 
Senior Policy Advisor at the Geneva Cities Hub, we really appreciate uh, our collaboration together in strengthening the mayor's engagement in the WUSIS process. And we look forward to, to the upcoming activities uh, organized with mayors uh, within the framework of the upcoming WUSIS uh, Forum 2023. So uh, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning uh, to, to everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Jamusi, uh, for, for your uh, uh, eloquent uh, introduction. Uh, thank you very much for ITU and for UN Habitat uh, to collaborating uh, with Geneva Cities Hub uh, to uh, organize uh, this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, and we are very happy to be part uh, of the TOKIX series. Uh, we believe it's a, a very useful tool uh, for the international uh, community. Uh, and even more, I would like to uh, thank our panelists uh, to uh, take the time and the energy to participate uh, in today's discussion and to share with us uh, their experiences, uh, because uh, we believe that uh, this multi-stakeholder approach uh, is the, the most efficient uh, way uh, of uh, learning from each other and to, to sharing uh, best practices uh, and experiences uh, to advance uh, the digital transformation. Uh, we have a, a very broad panel, uh, so I will be very short uh, and uh, would just like to focus uh, on uh, one, one point, uh, which is uh, inclusion, uh, because uh, I believe that uh, this multi-stakeholder panel uh, is a, a very good example of a, a truly inclusive uh, uh, and effective multilateralism uh, our common agenda, uh, the Secretary General uh, uh, really advocates uh, for. And without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, start this session uh, by uh, in inviting uh, our first speaker, uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, Mr. Eric Garcetti, who is due to the time difference, uh, sent us a, a video message. Uh, Mr. Garcetti is a was a four-term four LA City Council president, and uh, currently he's uh, handing his second term as mayor of Los Angeles, uh, a city which is very much uh, on the right path of digital transformation, uh, facing the challenges of uh, climate change uh, and uh, water management. Uh, so I think uh, he is uh, really a great uh, speaker to start uh, our session uh, with. Uh, after Mr. Garcetti, uh, we will uh, have the chance to listen to Ms. Daniela Torres, Ms. Cristina Buetti, Mr. Sami Kanan, uh, Tomas Gubinas, uh, Pavlina Pavlova, uh, Richard Bowden, and Graham Alabaster. So uh, without further ado, let's start the session with the video message from Los Angeles. Hey, everyone. I'm Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. And I want to thank the ITU Geneva Cities Hub and UN Habitat for bringing us together today. Like cities across the globe, LA is experiencing the impacts of climate change in everything from increased heat to wildfires, droughts, and more. But we are focused on building a sustainable and equitable future, including through a 100% renewable electricity grid. The Los Santos Department of Water and Power, which is the largest municipally owned utility in the United States, serves over 4 million people. And it has also increased its renewable energy mix from 23 to 43% just since 2013. And we're on track to be 97% by the end of this decade and 100% by 2035. To increase renewable energy, especially for low-income communities, my office and the Los Angeles Cleantech Incubator launched the Clean Energy Workshop we're working with Los Angeles County, our local utilities, and the private sector to drive innovation in Southern California to improve and decentralize our electric system and to pilot new ways of enabling smart grids. We're also partnering with NASA to improve our work around air quality mitigation by using machine learning to discover patterns in satellite and ground data measurements. Los Angeles is now the number one solar city in America, home to the country's largest feed-in tariff program and proud to be the largest city developer of renewable power. The investments we're making in smart systems today will make our grid more resilient and more reliable tomorrow. And that's why we're eager in Los Angeles to serve as a testing ground for digital transformation, 
whether it's a smart solution to renewable energy, grid challenges, or a startup looking to test smart grid operational practices. This is the moment for all of us to accelerate our transition to a greener and a more just future. And so we look forward to working with our partners in ICT to achieve that shared vision. From the bottom of my heart and from the City of Angels, thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, I, I believe that uh, uh, cities uh, uh, are really uh, key players uh, to building a sustainable and equitable uh, future and the development of smart uh, systems today uh, make us uh, more resilient uh, for, for tomorrow. Uh, on, on this introductory note, uh, I would like to invite our second speaker, Ms. Daniela Torres, uh, who is an expert on climate uh, uh, change and resilience. Uh, expert on smart, sustainable cities uh, at ICLE Europe, but also uh, works with the EU Smart Cities Marketplace Initiative. So have a global view uh, of this question uh, to uh, present us uh, with uh, an overall uh, picture based on her 15 years of experience uh, in uh, this area. Uh, Daniela, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andras, for, for, for this introduction. And, and also, yeah, after, after hearing the mayor of, of Los Angeles, I think that uh, we can get very inspired of what the cities are doing. Um, so I just wanted to share with you today uh, some reflections of, uh, based on, on the current experience that I have working now with, with local governments and also working in the last few years within the ICT sector, the ICT industry, especially also being part of the standardization efforts of, of ITU. And just to let you know that we have seen uh, sustainable cities more as a as a permanent permanent journey that cities have to have to have to uh, accomplish. We heard from from the mayor of, of Los Angeles that they are doing investment now to guarantee the future. So it really shows the importance of seeing these smart uh, sustainable cities uh, issue as a journey that cities have to uh, have to accomplish. So um, we also have to take into account that, uh, that while the time passed in this journey, uh, cities are facing new and emerging sustainability challenges. Of course, we know about the normal uh, environmental issues that cities have, waste management, air pollution. Uh, we also have traffic management, uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. But uh, also we, we know that there are other shocks that were not planned for the cities. COVID-19 was an example of this. And of course, cities have to um, respond faster uh, to these types of changes and shocks that are emerging uh, on time. In this, in this sense, we have seen in the last few years that cities across the globe, not only cities in Europe or in the US, but also cities in, in Latin America, for example, or, or Africa, we've seen that more and more there's a more um, integration of, of climate, environmental uh, policies. We have also seen that the issue of climate action is now uh, being more integrated due to the fact that cities are seeing the, uh, the effects of climate change in their territories. We also seen also an integration of, 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 of policies on circularity and also policies on the importance of bringing healthier spaces to cities, so make, bringing more nature to the cities, improving green areas on, on a city level to um, always putting the citizens in the center of these, of these policies. And in all this journey, we have also seen in the last few years that ICTs have always been there. And this is something that is not now. Of course, now we listen that there are more platforms and smart solutions, but we've been working on this for years. And I think that, uh, that ITU has been working on it for, 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 I think, that more than 15 years on, on trying to bring how technologies can really uh, support cities and, and, and regions in this, in this journey. Uh, and ICTs have always been there. Now they are more recognized, more uh, easy to identify on a local level. But of course, there's still a lot of work uh, to do. Uh, so in this journey that cities that want to be smart and sustainable at the same time, I think that um, there's a need also to see a little in the, in the future what it's needed to really advance in this journey, considering the current climate and energy crisis. Of course, uh, we see that cities... Um, have been working a lot on setting goals for uh, and ambitions for, for climate and environmental action. 
But we really think that now it's time for cities also to advance in setting realistic science-based uh, goals and targets that can really help them advance in their, in their journey. We also see that it's very important for cities to collaborate and create new partnerships, probably with, with, uh, with actors, the stakeholders that they didn't consider before. Of course, working together with the private sector, research and academic partners is key also to understand uh, sustainability challenges. And also, why not working with civil society organizations, with NGOs, NGOs that are also stakeholders that are in the um, in the ground on the city level to generate more insights, more projects. Of course, we also think that cities have to uh, explore new sources of data, technologies, and tools that might be already in the market or others are being, uh, are emerging in the market. So cities should be open to um, to these new tools in order to advance in this journey. Of course, uh, the cities and engagement component is very interesting thing, but we have to think about of a real really inclusive citizen engagement uh, processes, probably using ICT technologies, this can be made uh, better. Of course, measuring impact is a very important issue, especially if we want the products to upscale, it's very important to measure the impact on sustainability of ICT products based on existing standards, uh, existing methodologies. And I think that here, the work of, of ITU on the standardization process has been very important in these, uh, in these last few years. So there are standards already that support these uh, impact assessment processes. And finally, finance is always in the table when we talk about sustainable and smart cities. Um, that there is a need to, to, to find and bring the real economy uh, to finance and upscale this type of projects, which are different. These are projects that combine digital and, and, and physical infrastructure that sometimes are not well known by the, by the financial sector. So in this sense, I think it's important that we should work on this, uh, on this path. That's all on my side, just to, to give some insights of what is this journey of a smart and sustainable city so far. Thank you, Andras. Thank you very much, Daniela, uh, for, for this uh, really broad uh, overview. Uh, for me, it was very interesting to hear the combination of the digital, the physical, and the financial. Uh, and uh, and it, it sets really the tone for, for the rest of, of our discussion. Uh, let's uh, move back now to the cities. Uh, let me invite uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Sami Kanan uh, to to join us from Geneva. Uh, Mr. Kanan uh, is a three times mayor uh, of uh, the city of Geneva, uh, who also served uh, at the parliament of the city and of the canton of Geneva. So he has a broad view of the local needs uh, and, and plans. Uh, and uh, he is uh, one of our panelists uh, also because he's in charge of digital transformation in Geneva. So uh, we are excited to hear your experiences. <coughs> Sami Kanan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andras. Uh, it's a pleasure for me. I greet you all. I think it's a very crucial issue. We all agree, I'm sure, but the challenge is that even if I take the case of a modern, privileged, rich city like Geneva, it's not yet obvious to convince all partners, including in the city parliament, for example, that digitalization is more than just a technical issue. That is a really policy issue in many aspects. And by no means you should leave it to only experts in a way. I mean, experts are needed, we need them, specialists, IT experts, legal experts, but obviously we really have to make it clear that it's a policy issues like many others, that it has a lot of, of potential opportunities, good size, and obviously also caveats and challenges and risk, which should also tackle with. And so the a city is both in a way a company, a public company, uh, which has to, to be as effective as possible towards its uh, constituency, which is the population and the partners, but also it's a public policy making um, entity, which contributes to the public debate on many issues. So as a, as a public company, we should increase our interest in um, digitalization. We may be not as rapid or like uh, free, like private companies. On the other hand, it's also positive because we take sometimes a bit more time for the learning process and to be more inclusive in taking into account all aspects of digitalization, and not only just the kind of effectiveness, effectiveness or business aspects to, to make it just like bringing in uh, more benefits. And as a public policy-making entity, 
like we work on climate issues, on social issues, on many other issues, uh, we, we need to, to convince uh, the internal stakeholders, administration, uh, partners, public entities, autonomous public entities, private partners, and the population, that it is a matter of public interest to have a public discussion on it on all aspects, being uh, obviously the innovative aspects, what it brings positive, but also digital divide, for example, the fact that a range of the population is not catching up in a way with a very rapid uh, pace of technology development, ethical issues about data policy, uh, who owns the data, how it's processed, uh, the environmental issues, the impact, I mean, the carbon impact of uh, digitalization, access to digitalization, safety issues, how to limit the risk also for individual citizens. So we formulated a policy framework, which is inspired by also other cities we have been uh, looking at in, in Europe and elsewhere, uh, four pillars, as I just mentioned. The first one is everything which has to do with ethical and policy making uh, issues, uh, the way we, we handle data, uh, the way we also handle the environmental issue. The second pillar of the policy is inclusion. So how we fight against digital divide. We are now finalizing a network in Geneva with all stakeholders, especially in social policy, but also in other kind of fields, public fields. They are all fascinated by the question because they all agree that people who are in a way digital illiteracy uh, is, are lost because the society is being digitalized very rapidly and they don't admit that, I mean, it's difficult to, uh, to, to assume that you are not uh, catching up and try to hide it. And it's like illiteracy in general, you have been excluded from most processes and you're not there to admit it. The third pillar is innovation. I mean, really also fast innovation. We have in Geneva a very nice um, uh, network of very innovative people, groups uh, from the artistic scene, from the economic scene, from the high tech scene and so on. And we have to really connect them and, uh, and connect it with the public policy discussion so that all this innovation is really put in the public field and bring for the benefits for a majority and not for only uh, a few people. And the fourth one is obviously how to work as an administration as ex to be as exemplary as possible in many aspects, including cyber safety and the way we manage ourselves, our data. So not only make theories, but also in practice. We have put all this in a master plan and an action plan. Now going to the potential um, power of digitalization is administration. The first thing I have to say, we have to convince, as I said, the administration itself, that you cannot just call the IT manager and it solve everything. Any evolution, any change is a process in itself, which has to be collaborative with all stakeholders. The final users have to be included from the beginning. And it brings also a change, not only in IT, but in working process, even in the way people uh, implement their own uh, function. <clears throat> we have to fight some fear. Some people are afraid to lose their jobs, for example. So it's a very crucial change management. So the biggest challenge is not technical by human, especially if a technical project fails, then the mistrust is all the more strong uh, about new changes. So uh, we try to cooperate among various uh, local governments in Geneva and around in Switzerland to learn from each other because we are basically having similar challenges and especially to uh, how to use data we have, but we don't even realize the amount of data we have and to connect it in a positive sense, in a transparent sense, obviously to make real business intelligence, and which helps to, to cope with all the challenges we have to face. Climate in particular, very simple things. Uh, we have, for, for example, now a system for all the waste coming from companies, not from individuals, but from companies, being a restaurant, a producing company, a shop, they have to pay for the waste they produce to reduce waste. But uh, until recently, we have to take each bag of waste and to make it wait manually and then to make a special process to make the bill. Now everything is automatized from the, from the beginning to the end and make everything very rational and reliable. And the other example is smart metering in the buildings. I know many cities do it, but in order to save energy in a very concrete way and to improve the also quality of life, being about heating, for example, to have a very effective smart metering of how the energy is consumed. And especially now in the cri energy crisis, we are having, at least in Europe and in the world, it's all the more important to make progress. The third example is traffic management. It's not a new thing as such, 
but there is a whole range of improvement in how to to optimize the traffic management, not only cars, but all public transport and so on. So we are really trying to have a learning process. And I, I repeat that it is crucial that we work together as local governments and with uh, specialized partners being ITU and others and NGOs and prior companies. As I said, as everybody is welcome as long as we all agree that it's it's a matter of public interest. And so we have to be very transparent about the aims and the tools and the processes we are implementing together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor Kanan. Uh, thank you very much, Sami. Uh, it was a very insightful uh, uh, intervention uh, and uh, a, a very new aspect uh, as a social change management, if I note it correctly. Thank you very much for the concrete examples as well. Um, and let me continue uh, with our next speaker uh, from ITU, uh, our host and uh, co-organizer, Cristina Guetti, uh, who is the ITU focal point on environment and smart sustainable cities. So the very person uh, to uh, discuss this issue. Uh, and if I may say, uh, she's also one of the Geneva-based inspirational women uh, uh, to uh, work uh, to protect the on the environmental questions. So uh, I hope that uh, your intervention will inspire all of us. Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And uh, I, I think the inspiration definitely came from the previous speakers that gave, uh, you know, a lot of great insights. Uh, I would like to continue building, if I may, on, on you know, some of the uh, insights and consideration that uh, were shared by Mr. Kanan, and in particular on the fact that, you know, indeed, uh, cities now, they have to face complete different challenges and the process of digital transformation certainly uh, puts a complete new light um, in what cities have uh, have to do. In, in particular, we, we are seeing that uh, the role also of uh, digital technologies has changed completely. So while, you know, probably a few years ago we were uh, used to have uh, a technocentric approach where, you know, uh, we had various projects in cities run on technologies. Now the approach is completely def different and it's certainly human centric. The idea is to use digital technologies for good to help um, improve uh, people's life. So starting from, you know, making broadband available to, you know, um, new emerging technologies like Internet of Things or sensors that are being used, for example, um, you know, for uh, uh, climate uh, purposes, then, you know, new technologies like, for example, uh, big data that can offer great opportunity to analyze data and, you know, allow policymakers to make better informed uh, decisions. Uh, the idea behind is certainly to look at digital uh, transformation as an opportunity to, ag to advance the global goals and actually to drive urban governance, addressing social special disparities and promoting, you know, really integrated the sustainable development in cities and communities. And here I emphasize the word actually communities because that's really uh, where we um, cannot afford to leave no one behind. I think that, you know, the idea of, um, acting uh, local and go global is exactly that, that we, we have to work collectively to ensure that no one uh, is left uh, behind. Uh, by certainly coupling uh, digital transformation with the concept that, uh, for example, Daniela explained before on smart sustainable cities and you know the fact that cities they have, you know, a journey, and that's a permanent journey, using her own words, uh, we, we can, you know, make sure that uh, we are able actually um, to empower people and establish, you know, digital communities 
uh, we need to make sure that we we provide you know access to technology in an equitable manner we need to be responsible in managing data and creating digital infrastructure and of course building trust by securing digital assets so all of these can happen if we can work and doing so in a multi-stakeholder um, capacity. In, in, in this sense, I think that you know, we have uh, good initiatives like, for example, the United for Smart Sustainable Cities, that is a UN initiative um, that provides you know, an opportunity for cities also to look at um, the importance of, for example, doing self-assessments and, you know, measuring uh, in order to be able to establish realistic targets, but most importantly, also to bridge the gap between the excellent initiative which are being undertaken at the national level, but also those that are taken at the city level. Sometimes we see that, for example, there are very good initiatives at the city level, but there's no unique measurement method. Uh, for example, to be able to respond at the national level to international commitments, whether there are the climate targets, the SDGs. So that's where, for example, implementing, you know, international standards and having key performance indicators that can help cities to do their self-assessment um, can help policy makers to address actually and develop more effective policies. I think I'll, I'll conclude by certainly emphasizing what it was mentioned before that uh, digital transformation is much more than you know simply technology. It's really a, a, a complete uh, paradigm shift that is required at the policy level, where certainly you know policymakers are called and challenged, you know, by this uh, new opportunity, in my humble opinion, and that can have really a great impact on all of us talking first of all as an inhabitant of this planet thank you thank you very much christina uh, i uh, think uh, it is very very important that you put uh, our discussion uh, in the scope that uh, everything we do is to uh, to better inform and prepare decision makers and policy makers uh, to, uh, to, to make the, the right move to the future uh, using digitalization, be it data collection or implementation of standards. Uh, these are very, very important. Uh, the other point I, I uh, would refer to uh, from uh, your intervention is to think global and act local. And that brings me to our next speaker, uh, because after the global work of ITU, uh, let's go back to the local level. Uh, and uh, welcome uh, Deputy Mayor Thomas Gulbinas uh, for, from Vilnius, uh, who is an expert uh, not only in public services and governance, but also in the business uh, sector uh, from his previous uh, career. Uh, he worked in several multi-stakeholder environments, so I think he will be a very good bridge builder uh, today discussion uh, to explain uh, his views uh, on, on this important issue. Deputy Mayor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Sorini, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm really honored to be here with uh, today with you. Thank you very much for your invitation. Of course, this is super important and uh, uh, subject and a very timely event. Uh, going to our subject uh, immediately, Vilnius uh, recently has been selected as a uh, part of 100 cities mission for climate neutrality by, by the EU uh, with the ambition to become climate neutral by 2030, uh, which is a well tough, big ambition for the city. Uh, and we recently had a, a Baltic uh, cities mission conference together with the European Commission and one of the key points immediately that, that was made was actually about co-creation, that uh, different levels have to work together in order to achieve the result uh, of climate neutrality. So that's all European level, global level, uh, national, and of course, uh, local. Uh, and uh, I want just to reinforce the point that has previously already been made by 
my colleague from Geneva, uh, Mea Kanan, about actually using the, the traditional uh, instruments or policies uh, to achieve these goals together with the, with the digital ones, with the ones that the, the tech industry is bringing us today, because uh, it's very important that everyone is on board. But when you say everyone is on board, how do you talk to people uh, in order to have them on board and, and uh, uh, well, uh, adapting to the climate change? Uh, well, of course, you simply talk to them and technology helps to do that talk, I guess. But now more concretely on what we are doing in Vilnius, uh, one thing uh, that certainly has been mentioned already, but is key is that is the open data. I have put, put as my background, and you can see on your screens here, a map of uh, Vilnius. And actually it's not just a simple map, it's, it's the map of uh, solar intensity in, uh, on each roof of the city. We have that, that map available uh, and uh, it's actually an incentive for every citizen to check his or her own location and see whether their roof is uh, uh, solar intense uh, to, to have solar panels there. The est estimate is that if, we, if all the buildings in the world would get a, a solar panels on top of them. Actually, we would produce already with the current technology, we will produce four times more energy than, than we need. But this is not only the, the only application, of course, of, uh, of, of tech that we are doing. One, one very big area, of course, is transport in the city. Uh, sustainable mobility plan is the center of it. It's very important to have it. Uh, but it's even more important actually to, to have uh, attractive, uh, convenient and quick public transport so that people would start switching to that mode of transport in the city. And here, real-time data is key. We have real-time data from all the public transport in Vilnius, now shared it on, on three platforms. Uh, one is run by by the city itself, but then two are private. And the last one, the, the last edition came from Google. So now you can follow actually Vilnius transport movement in real time on Google Maps and plan your trip, plan your transit in the city. Uh, one more addition layer, I think, when we talk about digitization and adaptation to climate uh, is... Uh, the the use of drones and the data that can be collected by by the drones in the city what we call the second floor if the the, the ground floor is the street level the first floor in the city are the buildings then we we can also talk of the second floor which is which is drones many many functions can be uh, done by by drones actually surveillance traffic traffic surveillance but also there are some unexpected applications. For example, we used drones to, to take the temperature of the surface during the sunny days in July. And we noticed that a natural lawn, which means not cut at all in the city, is uh, four degrees Celsius cooler than the one that has been looked after and cut very short. You may imagine that four degrees centigrade uh, in the city when, when we talk about climate change and actually those heat islands that sometimes form in, in the cities is quite a, a big difference. So actually we can use drones even to have a, a lawn uh, mowing map of the city to see what makes sense uh, and what doesn't to really have uh, where we can have natural lawns and where we should really look after them and cut, cut short. Now, uh, one more uh, thing that I wanted to share with you also is that there are, with the new technology, there are new use cases for existing infrastructure in the city. Uh, we are now turning uh, street lighting poles in the city into electric vehicle charging stations. There is technology that 
that uh, has been uh, uh, has been developed that actually can go into the street pole and there's only a socket on the outside and uh, this street pole can be used to charge electric vehicles during the night when the street lights are on. Uh, it's a uh, slow charging, but still the serves very well in uh, residential areas with uh, big multi-flat uh, blocks where actually people cannot uh, take a cable from their kitchen and, and uh, charge uh, and charge their electric vehicles. So this is also what cities can do in order to promote uh, a different kind of mobility in the city, more climate friendly. I'll uh, stop with my remarks here and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor uh, Gulbinas. Uh, thank you for the very concrete examples. Uh, I think uh, it is really uh, the true added value of this kind of uh, global discussion we, we have uh, to showcase that there are uh, uh, some uh, easy and some more complicated uh, solutions uh, to the challenges we, we all face. Uh, I, I like very much the idea how the city can offer services or data uh, for its citizen, citizens to make the, the right uh, choices. When you were talking about uh, drones, uh, uh, I, uh, I also had in mind, uh, unfortunately, drones uh, we, we, we know uh, like arms. Uh, arms uh, and that brings me to the question of security, uh, because all new technologies and uh, possibilities bring also challenges. And I'm very happy that we have with us Ms. Pavlina Pavlova, uh, from the Cyber Peace Institute, uh, who is uh, an expert uh, in uh, cybersecurity and human rights. Uh, she uh, also uh, uh, offered and participated in several capacity building programs and trainings. Uh, so I'm sure that she will be able to present us with a very interesting approach from the security side of this question. Uh, Pavlina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me today. I'm very happy to take part in the webinar and importantly raise awareness about the um, importance of cybersecurity for digital transformation. I will highlight points in regard to critical infrastructure and in particular urban water management. So water management systems are critical for our lives. Water is a vital source, a basic human need, and an essential resource. But nowadays, most of the activities connected to providing water to people are automated and facilitated by technology. So while digital transformation is key for increasing the sector's efficiency and importantly improving the services as well as their environmental impact, it also introduces new vulnerabilities to the systems. With digitally interconnected systems, the potential of impact and harm caused by malicious cyber attacks increases. And this is both because of intentional targeted attacks against water facilities or other critical infrastructure facilities, and as part of a potential spillover effect in connection to other attacks. So effects of these threats can have different consequences on people. For example, by restricting access to water, by pollutants or poisoning entering the water systems, spreading infectious diseases, causing economic damage, and loss of trust in providers and governments. Cyber threats are already present. We've seen cyber attacks on, on uh, digital and waste management systems. For example, the cyber attack on the old smart water treatment system in the US in February 2021 when malicious actor intended to poison water because it was distributed to thousands of households. In August this year, a cyber attack on a British company that supplies drinking water to 1.6 million people has raised security concerns. For example, it could have impacted the company's ability to provide safe drinking water to its customers. Attacking water companies during a severe drought is a, tac uh, is a, is a tactic which is very similar to deploying ransomware against hospitals during the COVID-19 pandemic, during very critical events of global importance. 
Additionally, attacks such as, uh, such as these show that municipal water and other systems have the potential to be accessible targets to threat actors. Because the security of local government's computer infrastructure tends to be under-resourced and underfunded. What we also see is that water management systems have been targeted in armed conflicts. Parties in conflicts destroyed these systems to harm and forcefully displace civilian populations or to prevent the opposition to use these objects as elements of warfare. It's important to remember that infrastructure, which is essential for survival of the civilian population, is protected under the international humanitarian law. So these and similar attacks demonstrate that there are many motivations behind threat actors targeting water systems. It can be because of money, such as a ransom, or it may be motivated by geopolitical concerns. For these reasons, it's important to pull together good guidance to improve security for critical infrastructure sectors, which are uniquely vulnerable to such attacks. Digital transformation without necessary investment in cybersecurity measures put systems and importantly people at risk. Cybersecurity is still seen as an expense and not as part of the investment in digitalization. And it's not a priority, especially for small water providers. This sector faces a dilemma on how to balance limited financial resources for cybersecurity and increasing security needs. As a result, the operational technology and practices can be outdated. It's important to highlight that digitalization and cyber resilience are two sides of the same coin. More needs to be done to raise awareness about companies about cyber threats in this sector and the potential implications, and to do so through a multi-stakeholder approach, which can provide for a body of knowledge and facilitate different viewpoints, as has been mentioned in this webinar. Civil society organizations and industry can both offer experience and expertise to tackle this issue. I would like to outline a positive example, an initiative um, uh, which was called the Compendium on Protecting the Healthcare Sector from Cyber Harm, which summarized outcomes of a series of workshops which brought together practitioners, but also cybersecurity, policy, international law, and regulatory experts to identify lessons learned and good practices to protect this vital sector. So this cooperation between government of Czech Republic, Microsoft, and the Cyber Peace Institute is a practical example of partnership between stakeholders. As a model, this cooperation could be scaled up, but also focus on other areas of critical infrastructure. Many points raised in our workshops are relevant for resilience of critical infrastructure in urban areas in general, such as the overarching recommendation that cybersecurity must be understood as a continuous process. So actors and means of attacks will be always changing and risk management need to be prioritized. In my closing remarks, I would like to highlight the interconnectedness between cyber and physical security. Cyber attacks can cause harm to organizations and people, and this is very real harm, whether it's caused online or offline. And we need to work on increasing both physical and cyber security for improving the system's resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this insightful uh, intervention on this uh, aspect of security and human rights. Uh, I think with uh, climate change, uh, as uh, Mayor Garcetti mentioned, uh, we uh, uh, see more and more droughts and increasing heat, uh, which uh, affects, of course, water management. And if it's combined uh, with uh, intentional or spillover uh, malicious attacks, uh, uh, it can really uh, make harm. So uh, I encourage, based on your interventional mayors, to look at uh, this uh, cybersecurity aspect as an investment, as you mentioned, and not as a cost. Our tour, the table, would not be complete without a business uh, a partner uh, uh, who, uh, who is implementing projects on the ground or advising projects on the ground. Uh, that's why I'm very happy to invite uh, our next speaker, Richard Bowden, uh, Associate Director and Head of the Digital Services of ARUP. Uh, Richard has 30 years of experience in planning and delivering solutions for this kind of challenges. Uh, so I'm very eager to hear from you, Richard, some concrete examples uh, we can uh, see. The floor is yours.
You are muted, Richard. Thank you, Ambassador, and, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, hopefully you can uh, see my slides. Um, I want to really start uh, this presentation, which is about two specific case studies uh, dealing with climate change that are, are working on with our clients to follow Dr. Jamusi's references to quality of life. Uh, Arabs work in the area of cities and climate action is very much part of our global business strategy on creating a better world. Uh, and quality of life is always part of that. So uh, all our project work is uh, oriented towards um, better uh, sustainability and improved climate action. The two case studies I'm gonna talk about, firstly, Sponge Cities very much deals with a very practical problem that cities have around the management of water and in particular dealing with increasing flood risks. The second case study uh, is in the area of mobility analysis. And as we know, through different modes of transport, uh, these can be uh, drivers for increasing carbon emissions. So how do you cater for different mobility needs while also combating uh, carbon emissions? Um, so if we look first at, at sponge cities, the, the reason and importance from this, I think, is pretty clear from the various numbers. And again, these numbers in terms of how often disaster events in relation to flooding are happening, as we see here, 44%. The amount of people that are potentially impacted by this due to the increasing uh, uh, growth of cities and the populations, and therefore the direct um, impact uh, on flood damage uh, if global warming continues, are all examples of um, very good digital data analysis. And that is what you could say about Arab's uh, digital services work together with our engineering and design colleagues is providing that increasing and deep uh, evidential uh, knowledge. Because basically with this area in terms of rainfall and flood risks on cities, as people have referred to in previous um, uh, talks, it, there is increasing risks and uh, also widening opportunities for making changes. But how do you assess those risks and assess those opportunities? So as you can see, Arab has been one very involved in a worldwide sponge city index uh, involving cities like uh, Auckland, London, Mumbai, all the way through to Singapore and Sydney. Uh, and what's quite interesting, even with these eight cities, is the difference in terms of the structure of the city, the uh, different aspects of the city, and what that means for its sponginess. And I guess in simple terms, sponginess is really around the ability of the city uh, through its blue and green uh, infrastructure, i.e. parks and rivers, uh, to manage water more effectively, because the grey infrastructure, the roads and buildings are, are not up for that. The, the water just flows off and, and therefore the grey infrastructure is not, is not helpful. And in fact, uh, in respect of uh, COP27, uh, later this month in Egypt, uh, there are some African cities presently going through our, our sponge city index. So the archive is building. And in very simple terms, what the sponge index is created from is through uh, analysis of geospatial data and other data sources is uh, getting a percentage of how the blue, green and grey infrastructure is uh, makes up the city. And ideally, the more blue and green there is, uh, then the better the ability. Uh, together with soil type and vegetation, another important um, criteria, and then rainfall as well. Uh, and I guess what the Sponge City Index is, it's an example where a city then has a baseline, so to speak, in terms of where they stand now. And that's a perfect position then to assess risks and opportunities for improvement as regards the impact on that baseline uh, and how it improves so, things. So Richard, your slides are not stepping up. Uh, could you? Okay, let me just uh, I'll unshare. Yeah, that's great. And then I will. Sorry. 
Okay. Hopefully you can see the slide on Freiburg. Yes. Thank you. Great. Okay. So um, the city of Freiburg uh, is uh, obviously a well-known city in Germany. Uh, it has a very good uh, existing approach in terms of the different uh, mobility modes in the city from bicycles, walking to cars and public transport. But uh, they're now engaging with Arab to use a digital twin, which effectively is a model of uh, how the city works, uh, not just in terms of mobility, but other factors as well, because that's one of the aspects of a digital twin that allows you to look at different criteria and um, uh, as uh, you're looking at a, at a particular area and it starts to give you uh, an impact analysis across a number of different areas. So the, the whole purpose here really is to understand how uh, changing mobility needs can be catered for while at the same time managing carbon emissions. Uh, like many cities uh, in the world, Freiburg has a, a net zero plan um, and as part of a, a German uh, national program is progressing on that. Um, so just borrowing this image from the Future, Future Cities Laboratory, uh, what you have here uh, in terms of what a digital twin is, it's a real-time digital representation, taking data at different levels on different aspects uh, of the city to be able to look at different scenarios in detail. Um, and there are different levels of digital twin in terms of the degree of analysis uh, and the degree of real-time information. Uh, and I think running through all this, from an Arab point of view is here are the range of digital skills that are represented in Arab's digital services uh, global team. Uh, but these are means of which to analyze data to give insights, whether it's to policymakers or city management, so that they can understand, as I say, the risks and opportunities and focus in on the, the key areas um, that are uh, important and will make a, a big change for the resilience of the city uh, and for the quality of life of the people. Um, so I, I would just finish by referring back to Andreas, your point on inclusion and also the references to change management. Uh, essentially, um, the the aspect or one of the advantages of deep kind of data analysis through digital means is to have that inclusion taking in different perspectives and stakeholder needs and then also providing evidence to map out a change management path. Uh, apologies for the problems with slides and thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, Richard uh, to, to be with us and to sharing uh, these great examples uh, uh, which shows that uh, that effect and impact on the ground is possible uh, because both the, the sponge city projects uh, the digital twins uh, they are very concrete examples uh, how we can uh, put quality of life as you said uh, uh, in the in the center uh, of building a better future uh, i would reformulate uh, the un language uh, build back better saying uh, build back better quality life uh, and I, I think that brings us uh, back to the UN uh, level, and I'm very happy to invite as our last speaker and moderator of the uh, exchange uh, at the end of our session, uh, Mr. Graham Alabaster, uh, the chief of uh, the Geneva, Geneva office of UN Habitat, the organization uh, dealing with cities uh, most uh, in the UN family. Uh, and. Uh, Graham has uh, 30 years of experience, I think this year, uh, with UN Habitat, uh, and also some, a lot of experience with WHO and UNHCR. So uh, he is uh, the right person to conclude our discussion and present UN Habitat's uh, uh, perspective uh, and moderate the, the rest of the uh, panel. Uh, Graham, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Andras, and how delightful to be part of this session uh, on behalf of Habitat and to hear such interesting presentations this afternoon. Um, we've heard really a lot about, you know, cities and urban areas, and I think that nobody could have predicted how uh, over these past couple of years, the impacts of, uh, well, you know, a disease pandemic, climate change, and now also some conflicts um, in many parts of the world have really caused so much uh, uh, issues that were, have meant that we need to take the case of urbanization more, uh, more seriously. We've already heard that, of course, cities contribute the majority of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions, 
Um, but also looking quite more positively, um, you know, cities are going to be where the solutions come out. And that's what's so marvellous about uh, the idea of digitalization and how to improve the efficiency and function of cities. So just in my brief intervention, I want to share a little bit about um, our people-centered smart cities program. And then I want to give you a couple of very specific examples that uh, I've been working on uh, personally, uh, which look at some of the, uh, build on some of the detail we've heard already. So the people-centered smart cities uh, flagship program um, was launched by UN Habitat in 2020, and it provides strategic and technical support on digital transformation to national, regional, and local governments. And, you know, um, a big focus of this work has been inclusivity. And, uh, you know, of course, we saw from the COVID pandemic that this urgency was uh, made even greater. But we really want to help governments to bridge this digital um, divide and especially to ensure that the marginalised groups and informal settlement communities are brought in and we build more efficient uh, data management systems and we protect citizens privacy when using these digital services. So there, there's a range of, I haven't got time now to go into the projects, but um, there are a range of projects there and we've recently opened with support of the government of Germany, um, the UN Innovation Technology Accelerator for Cities. Uh, in Hamburg, and they're working, uh, the accelerator uses innovation, prototyping and applied research methodologies to develop innovative solutions that accelerate um, the achievement of the SDGs, which of course is what we're all working towards. So coming down to the detail now, I'd like to share with you two uh, examples where we're working in, in more detail. The first one is in relation to pollution, and um, UN Habitat is the uh, custodian agency in the, uh, amongst the SDGs for the part of the water goal that deals with wastewater. And of course, wastewater is a, an issue. It's becoming more of an issue uh, due to incidents of pollution, uh, the impact on the environment, but also on human health. But of course, more recently, um, the resilience of wastewater systems to uh, extreme climate events and um, you know how we manage some of the, of the pollutants uh, in an effective way. So since 2015, we've been working on ways to, um, to get better information on um, the types of pollutants that come into wastewater and how they're treated in countries. And it might shock you to know that we only have data on total wastewater for approximately 20% of the world's population. And for discharges from industry, uh, we only have data and information for 4% of the world's population. So we've been trying to look at the way we can use uh, digital technologies and approaches to support governments and member states and water operators and utilities to more effectively monitor wastewater. Yes, of course, to um, protect the environment uh, and protect people's health. But with the advent now of increased uh, energy costs, many uh, local authorities and suppliers are using, spending vast amounts of money just to treat wastewater. Wastewater, of course, is also, uh, there's a huge opportunity for reuse. And as we're gonna find uh, many areas of the world becoming more water scarce, the reuse of water and treatment of that wastewater so that it's safe to use uh, for the production of crops or other uses, is of critical importance and um, I think this will be an area which uh, there's huge opportunities and uh, particularly some in some regions of the world where uh, this has been neglected um, you know we, we can have a better understanding of what's going on. One of the reasons why there's been underinvestment in the wastewater sector is simply because we don't have we don't have a full understanding of the scale of the problem so in many cases and at the local level amongst uh, wastewater utilities and cities understanding wastewater and its role in the circular economy can only be achieved with much better data monitoring and actually wastewater is very interesting because there was a lot of work um, we were involved in some in UN habitat in so-called wastewater-based epidemiology and using uh, and tracking things like uh, the COVID um, uh, virus in uh, wastewater, but using it as a predictive tool about where 
uh, outbreaks were going to occur. So there's a huge um, untapped area of research to be done on this, which could be a very good early warning system, um, particularly in parts of the world where they suffer from wastewater and, and related diseases. Um, one other uh, area that we are also working on, and this is moving into uh, much more of the science of the future, uh, is on um, the applications of quantum computing uh, in helping to treat new pollutants. As many of you probably know, um, antibiotic residues in wastewater are one of the most critical things uh, on the agenda that uh, could effectively uh, reduce our ability to manage very common diseases. And the way that we uh, stop, one of the ways, of course, is we have to stop uh, antibiotics being discharged into wastewater in the first place, both from human sources and animals. But um, it's easier said than done because in many parts of the world where antibiotics are unregulated. So what we've been doing is, is working with, uh, with JESTA and the, uh, the, the so-called Geneva Science um, and Diplomacy Anticipator to see if we can use quantum computing technologies to design some new ways of removing antibiotics from water. And of course, that's a very complex, uh, a complex process, but using quantum computers and advanced computing methods enables us to design new materials uh, uh, to remove uh, a new, new chemicals, new biochemical processes to remove um, antibiotics from wastewater. So that's an area which may not you know, appear to be uh, at the forefront, but is something of the future. The second area, and this uh, relates also to um, the use of quantum computing, uh, and it concerns the production of fertilizers. As many of you probably know, uh, a large proportion of the world's energy is used in producing artificial fertilizers, mainly by fix a, fixing nitrogen from the air. Um, of course, nature does this much more effectively, but we've been relying on a process which is over 100 years old, which is highly energy intensive so-called Harbour Bosch process for making uh, fertilizers. But again, we're looking at how we can use quantum computing to um, replicate what nature does uh, in fixing nitrogen from the air. This is of course also a complex mixture of understanding the biochemical processes more effectively, and also um, designing ways of capturing the bacteria that fix nitrogen onto a particular matrix. So you can use quantum computers to design and simulate um, both the biochemical processes, but also they can, they can shortcut the, the design of materials to, uh, to entrap and immobilize biomass to perform the, 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 the tasks. And in, in, in the conventional world, you know, a material scientist would be somebody who would design a new, uh, a new product, it would be tested, and then uh, it would be modified. And of course, this process takes ages. If you use quantum computing, you can you can fast track that process and come up with some new ideas. So there's a couple of very, um, very uh, straightforward uh, examples of how, you know, looking at these high tech ways of dealing with um, with some environmental pollutants could be, could be very good. So I'm going to um, stop there and um, I know we're getting close to time. Uh, I'd like to ask if there's any of the panelists who would like to make any uh, final observations or comments um, before we move to the closing of this session. So I think you can, I, I'm, I, hopefully I can see if you raise your hands, but I don't know if anybody would like to offer any final words of wisdom. Um, uh, if not, I can make a very uh, a crude attempt to try and, uh, and summarize a little bit of what I've heard uh, this afternoon uh, today on this call. So we do have uh, one, uh, one person so far, uh, Ria, would you please unmute yourself uh, and, and go ahead, please? The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just put it rightly, but uh, you give me the floor. I appreciate, but uh, I will do it also concisely. Yes, uh, and I appreciate all what you, what you said and the celebration of our days. It's important having uh, the international call for uh, the ethical uh, aspect in the information society process which have been adopted on May 13, 2013. And this is important document we are working on that since then. And uh, 10 years later, we have, we see how much it has been evaluated uh, the WCS process. Just uh, 
as I waited, uh, as I make it uh, already rightly, but I, I want to mention also, yes, the network network of Geneva cities, because Geneva cities uh, administrated more than 15 network of cities until uh, Geneva cities have founded since a few years ago, but we found also the Geneva, Geneva Health Forum, Geneva Water Hub, and the Geneva Internet Platform. Uh, last October 25th, we got an important meeting with uh, Mrs. Dorin, and it's important also to, to, to go on that. But I want to underline on biodiversity, climate change, cities, and urban area in uh, smart cities, yet it's very important. And here the eff uh, energy efficiency, the important tool uh, in the urban area, it is more on biodiversity. Other uh, point I want to share with you also, yes. Since then, yes, with the support of state members, it have been uh, launched what it is uh, nowadays a department, I think I forget her name, sorry, madam. And uh, on behalf of state members, the Union for Sustainable Smart Cities is uh, working. And, but it's needed also, uh, experts are always uh, contributing, like uh, who are talking right now, but it's needed also the other contribution of uh, state members and the uh, private sector. Hopefully it was uh, clear and it was registered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Rio. Do I have any of the um, other panelists who would like to make any final interventions for those who are still there? Okay, um, fine. In that case, I will just make an attempt to, uh, just to make a brief summary uh, of what we've heard so far this afternoon. Um, for my takeaways from this very interesting meeting, and thank you everyone, uh, all of those who presented, uh, this has been a fantastic and a real uh, great opportunity to learn what you've been doing, what you've been involved in, and your thoughts and ideas. My first takeaway is that uh, with this uh, issue of digitalization in cities, it's highly important that we leave no one behind. Many of you, uh, as the panelists mentioned this, the involvement of communities, the protection uh, of, of uh, the privacy of data and understanding that. And I think this is a huge opportunity. Bridging the, di the digital divide is a critical uh, takeaway from this meeting. Secondly, and I think several of the presenters also mentioned this, that digitization alone is not going to solve the problem. It has to be combined with traditional policy approaches and used to enhance them. And I think that was uh, Mayor, Mayor Kanan mentioned that but also uh, the other, the mayor of Vilnius also. We heard some very uh, interesting examples, again, from the city of Vilnius about, um, you know, this idea of repurposing and retrofitting uh, um, uh, existing infrastructure in cities and how effectively you can use digital approaches to upgrade uh, existing structures. And this provides a sort of very no regrets uh, idea to move forward and to bring up to date many of the structures. We have this marvelous example of, uh, Vilnius of the uh, of the lampposts turning into charging ports uh, for cars. I thought that was very innovative. Um, I think really uh, my final sort of takeaway from uh, the, the discussions were there's huge opportunities, um, but we also must be mindful of the vulnerabilities. We heard from Pavlina about you know what can happen when critical infrastructure in cities uh, comes under threat from from cyber attack. And we do, as we move forward, have to ensure that we protect that critical infrastructure. Um, water is one example, transport, but many others. Health is another one, of course. And if we uh, are careful and mindful, uh, we can protect uh, cities in the future as we move forward from the vulnerabilities that they could be uh, exposed to if we move forward at too fast a rate. So without further ado, um, on behalf of the organizers of ITU, Cities Hub and UN Habitat. Thank you all very much for taking the time to the panelists for your excellent um, um, inter interventions and to those of you who joined uh, and have contributed. Um, all that remains for me to say is to wish you all uh, a happy the rest of the day and please let's keep in touch uh, sharing this information on some of these uh, fascinating ideas and opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. bye.